Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. I'm Dave Marshall and today's interview is one Laura recorded out in the field with Dr. Scott Wing. It's all about plants and what effect the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, a large climatic change, had on life at the time. First, however, we're going to go through the winners of the PaleoCast art competition. We had some fantastic participation with 67 entries and some 4,287 votes. For an amateur competition, the quality of the artwork was fantastic, and we loved each and every piece submitted to the competition. We had five categories, overall winner, under 16, 16 and over, invertebrates, and the Paleocast choice. Firstly, the Paleocast choice. To judge this one, the team got together and picked our favourites, and three of us chose the same piece, which was Juan Nicolas Elzard's Papercraft Trudon. The image was so clean, crisp and vibrant, and papercraft is something that we've never had before. The invertebrate category, which was set up so that we could reward diversity, was won by the Echinoderm master David Clark, whose depiture of Gineocrinus Morante came in joint fourth position. It's the second time David's won, which goes to show that there's a lot of love out there for Echinoderms. Under 16, we had some great submissions, and looking at the data, there's no distinction between over and under 16, so these younger paleo artists aren't in any way held back by their age, which I think is great news for the future of paleo art. The winner for this category, coming in 7th place overall, was again Jonas Hackens, whose picture of a swamp monster, the Eurypterid Hippotopterus, did really well in inspiring a lot of conversation all over Facebook. So, it shows that if you produce a piece with an unusual subject, and it gets shared in the right places, the votes really rack up. And from a personal perspective, it gives me great pleasure to see a Eurypterid win the prize. So I'm not sure how old Jonas is, but he's going to have to be 16 at some point, and then we'll see how he gets on in the older age group. So, the over 16s and the overall winner ended up as a two-horse race, way ahead of the rest of the field. We had Guillaume Fricard's Nothosaurus and J.W. Kirby's Yikshan Formation Exhibit. Both of these images went pretty viral on Facebook, gaining a lot of attention. Fricard's picture of swimming Nothosaurs was wonderfully shaded and was likened to the flying Dementors from Harry Potter, whilst Kirby's image depicted the fauna of the Yikshan Formation as displayed in a Natural History Museum exhibit. It gained public reviews of 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 13 out of 10, and if I can get this right, over 9,000 out of 10. And in the end, it was the Ikshan Formation exhibit that edged ahead, meaning that J.W. Kirby wins the Paleocast Art Competition 2016, with Guillaume Ficard taking uh, the over 16 prize. So thanks to all those that entered, congratulations to the winners, and we'll definitely run the competition again next year. So, back to this interview. It's a pretty long one, but by the end of it, you'll all be experts on the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. And as always, we've got loads of great pictures on our website to go along with this episode, and please like and share on social media. If you do like the show, please consider leaving us a rating on iTunes, and we've always got our donate button on the website. So, I hope you enjoy this episode. currently out in the field in the Big Horn Basin in Wyoming in the United States and I am chatting with Dr. Scott Wing who is curator of fossil plants at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Hi Scott. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm warm <laughs> and uh, exposed to the sun. So you might you might hear some scenic noises. We have some some bugs and some occasional aeroplanes but um yes that's just the sound of the field so i guess we could start with finding out how long you've actually been working in the bighorn basin because you're based in dc and you come out to wyoming every year and what actually brought you out here as a field site to begin with well my first summer in the bighorn basin was 1972 so 44 years ago Um, I came out just after I finished high school uh, with uh, 
a man named Elwyn Simons, who was a paleoprimatologist, someone who studies the fossil history of human ancestors. And somehow or another, I got included in on an expedition uh, where I was pretty much the youngest person there and taken along and we came out here to the Bighorn Basin and I kind of fell in love with the Badlands. That was really what got me into it to begin with. So you fell in love with the Badlands. What, what exactly is a Badland? Well, it's just really a rough, eroded set of hills that it's hard to travel across. So it doesn't really have a formal definition. But the Badlands here in the Bighorn Basin are are special from a geological and paleontological perspective anyway. Um, and the reason that they're special is that they are the hills are composed of rocks that were deposited as the mountains around here were rising back between about 50 and 60 million years ago. And the, as the mountains rose up, they eroded and the sediment was shed into these basins, which were subsiding. And the subsidence allowed a great thickness of sediment to accumulate back then. And in more recent times, the whole area has been uplifted and it's being eroded. So it forms these rough badland hills. And as the hills erode, it exposes the strata and the fossils that were deposited 50 to 60 million years ago. Okay, so I've been uh, traipsing up and down hills with you, up and down Badland Badland Mountains with you for the past couple of weeks, um, and I've had a, a short experience of what it's like to be out in the field here. Can you tell us more about what your field seasons are like? Well, usually I um, I fly out and I have a a sort of base in the town of Worland, a town of about five or six thousand people, and I pick up my very battered old field vehicle and head out into the field. I store tents in Worland and other field equipment, shovels and picks and all that sort of thing, camp stoves. And so we just drive out and set up a camp in some place that's sheltered from the northwest wind, which is usually the strongest. And um, then we begin operating in an area usually looking for new fossil plant localities, um, doing all sorts of geological work, uh, measuring stratigraphic sections. So we measure the heights of the, of the sedimentary layers so that we can put fossils in, in a time sequence. A lot of the field work, as you've seen, it involves driving around in, in a field vehicle and then getting as close as you can to a given set of hills or outcrops and then walking the rest of the way, uh, sometimes pretty rough terrain. The, the slopes can be kind of challenging because they're slippery. <laughs> they have a, a lot of uh, small nodules on the surfaces that, that are make it kind of like walking on marbles. That's basically what we do. Is sometimes we'll spend as days in quarries. We'll find a nice spot for collecting fossil plants and we'll expose the layer that has the fossil plants in it and dig up big chunks of it and split it with hammers, looking, looking at the surfaces, at the split surfaces where the leaves and other kinds of plant fossils are preserved. I've actually met quite a few other people out here, um, many of whom I think you bump into every year. Are there a lot of people working in the Bighorn Basin? Yes, the the Bighorn Basin is really kind of a, um, it's a center for a lot of work on fossils and rocks of, of this time period, this 50 to 60 million year old time period. And it's been a place that's, um, that's been important in paleontological investigations for over a hundred years. The earliest paleontologists came here in the 1880s, which was um, when there was really very little settlement uh, in this part of Wyoming at all. And they arrived in buckboard wagons and drawn by horses and uh, camped out and 
wandered around looking for fossils. And uh, so there's some continuity between then and now. Uh, we difference is really just that we drive trucks instead of uh, wagons. But um, there are a lot of vertebrate paleontologists who work here. So people who are interested in the in bones and teeth who study the evolution and change through time in fossil mammals and turtles and lizards and all sorts of, of um, vertebrate organisms. And then there are other people who are interested in the fossil soil horizons. So when these rocks were deposited as sediment by rivers millions of years ago, um, the river would flood and then there would be an interval of time where no fresh sediment was deposited and there was time for plants to grow on the surface and for soils to form and then more sediments would come in and cover that soil horizon and basically fossilize the soil horizon so there's a lot of information that you can get so we have people who work on the fossil soils here there are others who study the channels the sandstone deposits that represent the ancient channels from which those sediments uh, came. And then other people who are interested in the, the chemistry of the sediments, um, and then people like me who study fossil plants. So there's really a very wide variety of disciplines represented by the people who work here. And they keep coming back, and that's partly because I think it's uh, it's a really nice place to work. But it's also because the the combination of all these different perspectives has created a framework that is really helpful to anyone uh, who wants to to ask um, questions that are um, that require distinguishing between short periods of time many millions of years ago. So the, there's a, a what's called stratigraphy. It's the study of the layers of sediment and how they're deposited through time. And um, something that's very difficult to achieve is, is a highly resolved stratigraphic record. So if you're looking at things that happened 50 or 60 million years ago, it's often really difficult to say, oh, this is a particular... 100,000 year interval, or this is a particular 10,000 year interval. Um, and that's particularly difficult in rocks that were deposited on continents because they tend not to be uh, deposited in perfectly flat layers over big areas. So this is one place where there's been so much study by so many people for so long that there is a framework that you can kind of plug into, particularly if you can find somebody who's spend a lot of time here and you can say, how do I get to this particular 100,000 year <laughs> interval that's, uh, you know, I'm really interested in, in 56.1 million years ago. And uh, if you, if you, th there are really not many places where you can, where someone can say, oh, well, you, you know, you go out this road, make a left turn, drive to the end. There's a hill there. It has a bunch of layers in it. There's a really bright red one, go there, and you'll be 56.1 million years ago. So that's the kind of um, advantage of having had all these different perspectives uh, working in the same in the same sedimentary basin for so long. Yeah. So you mentioned briefly that uh, fieldwork is pretty similar now to how it would have been when people first started coming out here. Um, you know, do you think there are kind of real differences? Is it easier now? Do you get stuck in the same places? <laughs> you know, the, the, I thought about that. I, the, the physical field work is really remarkably similar. I, you know, again, we drive trucks, they drove buckboard wagons or rode horses. Uh, I don't think we go much faster most of the time once we're, you know, of course, you can get to a field area faster by driving on a road. But once you get there, uh, you're going to be going just very slowly, probably not much faster than you would on a horse in your in your truck. You can carry more. You don't have to feed the truck uh, <laughs> except petrol. But anyway, the. It's um, so the physical part of it. I think it's really pretty similar. 
the the tools are of course a bit different. Um, the biggest revolution really has happened since I started working here, and that's um, what's happened because of having uh, global positioning devices, and uh, we now can take a reading with a GPS and and then we know exactly where that locality is plus or minus well depending on what kind kind of gps you're using either plus or minus a few meters or plus or minus a few decimeters and um, that lets us position fossils and um, and strata much more precisely in space which then allows a lot of analyses to be done in the lab that we couldn't have done before but you know, and also the photography is so much easier than it used to be. So people now regularly come back to the f from the field with hundreds or thousands of photographs, documenting where they've been, showing the relationship between different um, stratigraphic levels, and that is satisfying to be able to document things that way. But you know, those are those are actually relatively small differences. Uh, in, in terms of what it's like every day to be in the field. Um, I think the biggest difference between long ago and now is really more our perspective or what drives us, the kinds of questions that drive us. So we back then it was really pretty much exploration. I think, you know, no one really knew what was here, even in a, the most general sense. So people would arrive and wander around and and just they were looking for fossils and and anything they found was interesting and and they made a lot of wonderful discoveries but now i think there's much more focus when we come to the field so we might be um, driven to be here by uh, a specific hypothesis or idea um, that is something we want to test. So we're, we're interested in, oh, you know, we think um, a certain event happened at a certain time and we want to see if there's any evidence for that event in the fossils and the rocks that we know are here. So we're a little bit more targeted than we used to be. You've talked about it a little bit, but could you go into a bit more detail about the geological history of the basin and, and what kind of structure you actually see here now? Hmm. Well, you know, when, when you say basin, uh, we really do mean a basin. It's, it's a lower area, so the, um, the elevation at the, at the bottom of the basin here is, is uh, probably about 1,500 meters, and it's surrounded almost entirely by mountains that are much higher than that. And uh, on the west side, there are the Absaricas and the Beartooth Mountains, and on the east side, the Bighorn Mountains, and across the southern end of the basin, uh, the Owl Creek Mountains. And all those mountains are roughly the same age. They, they, were, they began rising something like 60 million years ago. And as they were uplifted, they were being eroded, of course, by streams, and the sediment was carried into this bowl between the mountain ranges. And the weight of the sediment itself, plus uh, faults that had formed along the mountain fronts, allowed the basin to sort of drop. So you have basically a big bowl full of sediment that's sinking between mountain ranges. So that these faults that, that bound the basin um, have really slid a very long way. Um, so once the basin side's dropping down, the mountain side moving up, and the result is that uh, in a lot of places there might be as much as uh, three or four kilometers of sediment uh, in the basin, three or four kilometers of movement along that fault, which has allowed this huge thickness of sediment to be deposited in the basin. And of course, now that's all being weathered away again into these badlands. Is that type of environment particularly good for preservation of plants? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, in order to get any fossil preserved for very long, it has to be covered up and 
um, protected from the natural recycling processes that that uh, would turn organic matter back into more plants and and animals. So um, you have to basically keep the dead remains of a plant or animal um, covered up in order to prevent it from being recycled. And so anytime you have a basin that is being uh, filled up rapidly with sediment, you have the potential to, to, uh, to protect um, those remains from, from being reworked. So lots of sediment means a lot of opportunities to, um, to preserve fossils, both, both plants and animals. And what specific kind of environment or sort of depositional settings have led to the preservation of plants in this basin? Mm -hmm. so, so as the rivers were depositing the sediment that, um, that fills this basin, there are a couple of different sub-environments that were particularly good for preserving plant fossils. Uh, one of them is that, that uh, you know, any stream meanders along and occasionally will cut off a piece of its channel and that forms a little pond, basically. And sometimes they're called oxbow ponds because they're curved like the, like the bend of a river. And plant remains will fall into that pond and then uh, be covered by mud. And that's a really good place to preserve plant fossils because it's underwater and it doesn't, the surface of the sediment doesn't become a soil because it's underwater. Um, and if you get a few meters of, of mud in, a, in an oxbow pond, that can be a really great place to find plant fossils. So when I'm out here prospecting, looking for places to collect, I'm often looking for uh, a body of sediment in the side of a hill that forms a little lens. And that lens is the shape of the ancient channel. It's got a curved bottom, cur upward curved bottom, and a sort of flat top. And usually the sediment within it will be a mud that's relatively gray in color because it has plant remains in it. So that's one type of environment. There's another type that's um, a little uh, less common and those are uh, intervals of time when the floodplain itself was very wet. And um, so you, you could get a large uh, floodplain swamp, basically, with trees in it. But this probably only happened at times when the floodplain was underwater for at least several months a year. And in those conditions, you also can get the preservation of, of leaves and other other plant fossils. And because they're much more laterally extensive, you can find those beds more easily because they're, they're quite, um, quite easy to see from a distance and they go for a long way. So you might see for several kilometers um, a bed or a stripe across a, a bunch of hillsides that's got a dark color, again, reflecting the the organic remains, the leaves and, and pieces of wood and so forth that are, that are um, trapped in the sediment. And um, those are also really good places to, to collect plant fossils. So there are these cues, there are cues in the, in the hillsides uh, that we try to take advantage of when we're looking for new places. So you see one of these lenses and you go up and you get a shovel and dig a hole in it and there are some fossil plants what is then the process for kind of investigating further or getting getting them out the rock well it's it's tr true that that you can sometimes go up to one of these uh these um potential plant fossil sites and stick in your shovel and out comes a rock with a plant fossil on it. I'd have to say probably 90% of the time or 95% of the time you pull a piece of rock out of the, out of the side of the hill and there's nothing in it. So <laughs> most of the time there aren't plant fossils even where we think there should be. Um, but once you do find a spot, then uh, generally what we do is we... Uh, try to establish exactly what level the very best fossils are coming from. So that's just a process of 
using your shovel and pick to work up and down the hillside, you might eventually find that the best fossils are coming from a three centimeter thick interval um, somewhere on that, the side of that hill within that deposit. And then you would clear off above that, trying to um, expose an area where you could get back away from the surface weathering, find bigger chunks of rock, and then you would um, carefully pull blocks of the most fossiliferous rock up. You would chop them open with your hammer, and when there's a f good fossil there, you mark it with a locality number so you know where it came from, and then you wrap it up. We have um, this really high-tech uh, wrapping <laughs> system that involves uh, industrial sized rolls of unperforated toilet tissue and um, that turns out to be a really good way to wrap it up. It's kind of like wrapping a, a compression bandage around the, the fossil. You're basically holding that soft rock together so it doesn't come apart on the way back. And then we um, we surround those packages with with foam and put them in wooden crates back at, in town and pack up the crates and send them back to the Smithsonian, to the, to the museum, uh, where we unpack them, reverse the process, uh, take them out. And then there's often a lot, of, um, a lot of preparation of the fossils that needs to be done. So you have a good part of a leaf, say, on a, on a bedding surface of, of, a, of a rock. You've split the rock. You see half of the leaf, and the, the other half of it's still covered up with, with rock. So at that point, um, people in the museum will use very delicate tools to basically flake off the rock that still covers uh, part of the leaf. And when they're finished, then the fossil is ready to be studied. So it sounds like they're quite specific depositional settings for plants. Um, and you also said that 95% of the time you don't find them where you think they definitely should be. Um, how does that kind of record compare to other kinds of fossil records, maybe of sort of vertebrates or, or marine organisms? Yeah, the, the plant fossil record is really pretty different from the, the fossil record of, of animals. Um, it, out here, the, the vertebrate fossils, the bones and teeth, generally come out of the fossil soil horizons. So um, kind of makes sense, you know, a, a bone or a tooth is pretty hard. It's a mineralized structure, the calcium carbonate in the bone or the appetite in, a, in tooth enamel. Those are, those are really hard mineral uh, structures, even when the animal's alive. So when it dies, the bone or tooth can get buried in, in a soil. The soil can be fairly active biologically, but still not uh, destroy that, that bone or tooth. Um, and once it's fossilized, then as the fossil soil weathers, the bone or tooth can weather out, and it's still harder than the rock around it. And so that means that if you're interested in vertebrate fossils, you can basically you can scan the surface and the, it, you will find weathering out of the rock these bones and teeth. And that, that gives you uh, a way of kind of, I know, basically it concentrates the fossils. So, and it frees them from the rock that mm -hmm. surrounds them, does a little bit of the work for you ahead of time. So that's, that's a pretty different kind of record um, than, than the record of plants. Um, it also means that there are differences in the way the original biota is being sampled. So uh, because leaves and plant pieces are really pretty delicate and pretty, um, they, they basically they decay very quickly, um, it takes uh, a sedimentation event to trap a lot of a lot of plant remains and that's not quite so true for the vertebrates so when you you're walking along a fossil soil horizon finding vertebrate fossils they might be animals that lived in that 
in the time of that soil, but over a period of maybe centuries or maybe even millennia um, when that soil was developing. Whereas the plants, because they're so quickly decayed, you're probably looking when you collect at the when you collect a locality with plants in it, you're probably looking at plants that all lived in a period of just a few years or decades that were trapped by one or two or three very rapid sedimentation events. So um, it, there's a different amount of of um, what we call time averaging. So there, there's uh, a certain amount of, of um, time during which a given uh, assemblage of vertebrates will have accumulated in a soil. And that's, as I was saying, that's sort of more on the order of centur centuries or millennia, whereas for the plants, it's really more like years or, or maybe a decade or two. So they represent different amounts of time. Is that an advantage or disadvantage, do you think? Well, I think it's, you know, these it's both an advantage and a disadvantage because if, uh, if you think about it, the having such a the plants are such a snapshot. That's really the way to think about it. It's almost like as if you um, you are someone gave you a camera and sent you back fifty five million years and said you can lie on your back and take a picture of the forest over your head, and then you have to come back again. <laughs> so right. you see a, an instant in time. And it's you see the forest that was growing in an area right around where the fossils are are preserved, um, and in a way that's nice because it you know that those plants were actually living with one another in the same environment in the same local environment, um, and that's a powerful. Um, thing to know because it, it means that that these are really organisms that lived together with the the, the disadvantage <laughs> the disadvantage of this is that that you don't know very much about the world of that time period so if you want to have um, a broader picture of what plants were around at that same time you have to branch out you have to go to the field many times find many localities and put them all together in order to get a more regional idea of what the what the vegetation was like with the with the vertebrates because you might be collecting the remains of animals that lived over over centuries or even millennia you can sort of use the averaging that happens uh, so um, the spot you're collecting from might have been uh, a clearing at one point, and then 300 years later, it might have been a forest, and another 500 years after that, it might have been a stream, and so on and so forth. And that all of those organisms are preserved more or less together. So you're getting a slightly fuzzier picture, but a much more complete picture. You've mentioned 56 million years ago pretty frequently already. So I think it's time to find out... Um, what was happening 56 million years ago and why Why um, this is a great place to, to find out? Yes, 56 million years ago is, is uh, a number that lives large in my <laughs> imagination and my thoughts. It's, um, it's a time, it's, it's right at the very beginning of the Eocene epoch. So um, it's, uh, it's kind of a dividing line between time periods. And the reason it is, is because there's a really remarkable event that occurs 56 million years ago. It's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Uh, we usually refer to it as PETM because that's less of a mouthful. And it's an event that um, a lot of geologists and paleontologists are interested in studying. It's uh, begins with a very large release of carbon to the atmosphere and ocean. So something we think on the order of 5,000 gigatons of carbon. That's just to give you a sense, that's probably about how much carbon is in the fossil fuel reservoir today. If we were to burn all of the oil 
and coal on the planet that would be about 5,000 gigatons of carbon. And it was released into the atmosphere 56 million years ago over a period of just a few thousand years. So it's very rapid uh, geologically, maybe even rapid by human standards, and a very large amount of carbon. And that's accompanied by uh, an increase in the Earth's temperature of about five to eight degrees Celsius and all sorts of climatic effects and acidification of the ocean and um, changes in rainfall patterns and changes in ecological communities, both in the ocean and on land. So it's, it's this massive shift in um, the planetary environment and also in, in ecological communities. And of course, it has a lot of resonance with today and the future. So um, the reason so many of us are interested in the PETM is that, that we see it as a way of um, sort of testing ideas about the effects of uh, present and future global warming, carbon release and global warming. So what will happen to us or what will happen to our descendants is something that we think we can understand better by studying the fossil record. To what extent do you think the PETM is a good analog for current climate change? Well, there, there are ways in which it's a good analog and ways in which it isn't. Um, I think the, the strongest um, comparison is, is just in the amount of carbon that was released. Uh, that seems to be uh, kind of at the upper end of what we think might eventually be released uh, by humans. Um, there are also very important differences. As best we understand right now, the release at the PETM probably took two to 4,000 years, and we're on track to release that same amount in more like 500 years total, um, maybe less than that. So um, perhaps it's an order of magnitude faster now than it was uh, 56 million years ago. That's a, that's a very important difference that the, the rate is so much higher now. Um, another very important difference is that, that uh, prior to the PETM, uh, the planet was already a very warm place. So there were forests growing all the way to the shores of the Arctic Ocean, probably forests covering the Antarctic continent. There were basically no ice caps anywhere on the planet, even before the PETM started. And the reason that's important is because uh, a colder planet, like the one that we're in, that we occupy now, has polar ice caps. And that, in many ways, makes it more sensitive to the effects of, of warming. Because when you begin to warm the planet with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you start to melt the ice near the poles uh, melting ice then exposes darker ground. The darker ground absorbs more heat, so you get what's called a positive feedback effect, basically a vicious cycle where warming produces bare ground, warms the planet even more, melts the ice even faster, and then you get more bare ground exposed and so on and so forth. So um, when the PETM happened, that was an insignificant effect or maybe not present at all because there, were, there weren't any ice caps. Um, now we have to reckon with that sort of positive feedback um, effect of, of um, melting back the ice. So we have reasons to think that um, in, terms of, in terms of the ice uh, feedback mechanism that uh, the changes might be much greater today than they were at the PETM. And the same goes really for the rate of change. Um, the faster you change things, the harder it is for organisms and, and ecosystems to adapt to those changes. And um, so um, there are many ways in which the PTM is, is kind of a, um, maybe a, a little brother to the kinds of changes that we might cause, uh, even, if, even if we um, don't end up releasing as much carbon. So 
what is the actual kind of evidence in the record here in the basin and maybe in in other places globally um for for this thermal maximum event well the 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 paleocene eocene thermal maximum was was originally identified in marine cores so it's not something that we've um that we found straight off here but the interesting thing is that when once it was found in the marine cores um people turned to the Bighorn Basin because they knew it had such a good record of that time period. Um, and as soon as they started looking for the PTM here, they realized that it occurred in a place that was already of great interest. So the the mammalian faunas um, in the Bighorn Basin had long been known that uh, there was a particular interval where the first horses appeared, the first uh, even toed ungulates, the ancestors or relatives of sheep and cows, things like that, and also the first primates. They all appeared at just about exactly the same level, and that turned out also to be where the PETM was. So the, the big transition, really the biggest changeover in, in the composition of mammalian faunas in the whole last 66 million years happened 56 million years ago and it happened at the PTM. So when um, when scientists who were interested in the PTM started looking here they found, oh, the PTM we already were we are already studying that time interval. It's when the, the big change happens in in uh, in faunal composition. So it uh, turned out to be maybe not so surprising that there was a global event at that time. Do you also see a big change in the fossil plant floras? Well, you know, for the fossil plants, it was it was really interesting because for a long time. Uh, going back to the mid 20th century, uh, it had been kind of a problem to to even uh, see that Paleocene and Eocene floras were very different from one another. Um, the transition seemed to be kind of a gradual one, and so many years ago, when I um, first learned about the PTM, I thought. Uh, it would be an important and interesting thing to do to see if I could identify that change, uh, a change associated with that with that global warming event here in the Bighorn Basin. It was really the only place where I could I could think of to study that event in the plant fossils. Um, so I set out trying to sample Paleocene and Eocene and floras that came from the PETM. Um, right at the start of the Eocene. And it took me, oh, about a dozen years before I found the first PETM floras. It was really hard, (laughs) Um, and it required quite a lot of luck. Um, And so I went through a period where I had samples from the very end of the Paleocene, say 56.1 million years ago, and or 56.2 million years ago, and I had samples from the early Eocene, say 55.8 or 55.9 million years ago. And the strange thing was that they weren't really very different from one another. They had they had many, many species in common. And I started to think, well, this is really odd because plants are exquisitely sensitive to climate. And yet we have this big climate event at 56 million years ago, and it doesn't seem to have done anything. It just seems that the plants sailed on through. And so I was really puzzled by that. And But I kept looking because I knew I didn't have samples exactly from the PETM. It turns out finding, finding fossils in a particular 100,000-year interval 56 million years ago is not easy. And surprising. Yeah, it's. I mean, it. You would think a hundred thousand years. It's a very long time. But um, when you're looking fifty six million years ago, it it's not so easy. Anyway, it after after those dozen years or so of 
wandering around the Badlands looking for plant fossils preserved in exactly the right time interval, I finally found them. And it turned out they were utterly different from the Paleocene samples I had or the Eocene samples. So, uh, in fact, the climate change had shifted the composition of the of the vegetation here, and um, the plants from the PETM had almost nothing in common with those before and those after. So the way I the way I often think of it is, uh, if you could imagine taking a trip, you know, what would the what would the forest look like? And um, for uh, some people, uh, for North American uh, listeners, you know, it would be kind of like going from uh, the coast of Georgia or South Carolina or North Florida, a warm, wet climate um, like that. Um, that would be more or less like the, um, the forests that were growing in the Bighorn Basin at the end of the Paleocene. And then in a very short period of time, it would be as if you had suddenly brought in a whole different cast of characters that are typical of the dry tropical forests of southern Mexico. Um, so a very big change in the composition of the vegetation. And then those plants persisted here for maybe 100,000 years or so. And then the climate cooled. The rainfall picked up again, and the forests that had been um, growing here before basically came back. Some of the species had gone extinct. They never returned. But there were also a few new kinds of plants that hadn't been here before that probably were able to disperse in from other continents. Um, so that there's a, a little bit of change, but... Um, the forests that come back after the PTM are very similar to those that uh, were present here before. So what are some classic kind of wetter Paleocene or Eocene species and drier mm. PTM ones? So the so a, a, a very typical um, late Paleocene flora would have sycamore relatives, uh, something like London plane tree, um, and... Uh, members of the birch family, um, it would have uh, palms, little, probably fairly small palms, uh, things uh, like sable palms that would grow in in uh, the southeastern uh, U.S. today. It would have uh, relatives of katsura tree, which is something that uh, today is only East Asian. Dawn redwoods, another East Asian plant. So a kind of mix of of uh, conifers, but also broadleaf trees that shed their leaves every year on a, on a schedule like that. Um, so that would be a typical Paleocene forest, a typical uh, forest during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum would be much more likely to have um, members of the, of the bean family. It's a very important family today in the dry tropics. And um, they seem to have done very well during, during the PETM. Um, and uh, then there are a host of plants that, honestly, we don't even know what they are yet because uh, there hasn't been time to figure it out. Um, but uh, a few of them we have, we have pretty good ideas of. They're, um, there's a strange uh, relative of the laurel family. Uh, the the genus name is Gyrocarpus. Uh, has little helicopter like fruits, and that's a a plant that today is very common in dry tropical forests in southern Mexico and Central America, and also in the Old World. And it was here during the PETM, and then after the PETM, back come the sycamore relatives and the birch relatives and. Um, walnut relatives and so on and so forth. So it, again, um, the, the, uh, the plants start to look a little bit more like a warm temperate forest instead of a dry tropical forest. So we have this good evidence from the plant and animal fossil record of it getting drier and hotter. But how? So what's the specific evidence that we have this huge release of carbon and do we know where that came from? 
Well, the the carbon release is um, there. There are really several lines of evidence for the carbon release. the The most important one is a change in the uh, chemical composition of carbon, and that's something that's seen all over the world. So this is hardly unique to the Bighorn Basin, but it's a very useful tool as well. Um, so. Carbon comes in various isotopes. There are different different numbers of, of neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. And two of those isotopes are stable. There's carbon-12 and carbon-13. And they're not like the carbon-14 that's used in dating things. So we have to sort of set that aside. But 13 and 12 are both stable. And the lighter isotope, carbon-12, is uh, used by plants and animals much more uh, readily because it, it's lighter and it's more chemically reactive. So when a plant is photosynthesizing, it's taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and converting it into its own tissues. And when it does that, it discriminates against the heavy carbon, the carbon-13. And so its tissues... Um, have more carbon-12 relative to the atmosphere. Um, well, the result of that is, that, and, and this is you see, all living organisms basically tend to have uh, a preference for carbon-12. Well, the, the shift in chemical composition that happens at the PETM is that suddenly almost everywhere in the world where it's been measured you see an increase in the relative amount of carbon-12 in the teeth of animals, in the shells of marine organisms, in the, uh, in the organic matter left behind by plants, um, all sorts of, of materials. If you measure them across that, that PETM uh, interval, you see a sudden increase in the amount of carbon-12. And what that tells us is that some very large reservoir of carbon was released. And it also tells us that it was not just any carbon, it was, it was organic carbon, because organic carbon has more carbon-12 in it. So um, we, we get both a, a, a sort of timeline or a little spike that shows us what time it was, this makes it easier to find the PETM, this shift in carbon isotope ratios. Um, but it also tells us that carbon was released. So that's one line of evidence, uh, the change in the isotopic composition of carbon. Another line of evidence for the carbon release is that in the ocean, in ocean sediments, um, you go from having chalky sediments, um, calcium carbonate, uh, sediments at the bottom of the ocean in many places to having clays. So the, the, the carbonate, the chalk, is not being deposited. And that signals a change in the pH of the ocean and in the solubility of carbonate in the ocean. And basically it's ocean acidification that um, is, uh, is happening, and that's the result of dissolving carbon dioxide in the ocean makes it more acidic. So that's the second line of evidence for this big carbon release. And then the final line of evidence is just the increase in temperature itself, which is now known to be a global phenomenon. Globally, temperatures increase, and that's consistent with what, with the greenhouse effect. So we have those three different lines of evidence for um, for this big carbon release. So then the question is, well, where did that carbon come from? And that's something that we're still we're still struggling to answer that. And we think the answer might be a little bit complicated. We may, may have come from more than one place. Um, so I mentioned that the isotope shift, this sudden increase in the relative importance of, of carbon-12, tells us that the that the carbon came from an organic reservoir stored carbon that had been processed by the biosphere. Um, there's one source of carbon that's particularly has a particularly uh, particular preponderance of carbon 12 in it and that's um, methane ice deposits that are in the bottom of the ocean. So this, the sediment at the bottom of the ocean um, has a lot of organic matter in it. The organic matter is 
decayed by microbes. The microbes release methane as a byproduct of their metabolism, and that methane has a very high preponderance of carbon-12 in it. The methane gets trapped in the in the um, relatively cool waters at the bottom of the uh, in the sediment that's cooled by waters at the bottom of the ocean, and it forms a semi-stable ice-like compound that's sometimes called methane clathrate. Um, the clathrates are kind of a prime suspect for the for the primary release of carbon at the beginning of the PETM, and that's because um, they can be released very quickly if they become destabilized. And they also have the right isotopic composition, the right dominance of carbon-12 to be to explain this global change in, in carbon composition. So we think uh, methane clathrates are the most likely initial source of carbon at the beginning of the PETM. The, then the question is, well, can they explain all of the carbon? And many of us think probably that's not where all the carbon came from because the very warm climates and the carbon release were sustained for probably tens of thousands, uh, bordering on maybe a hundred thousand years. And the um, that carbon probably comes from somewhere else. And we think one of the sources is probably organic matter in uh, in soils. So we think there are some feedbacks that are going on where once we we have the initial release of carbon from the methane clathrate deposits in the ocean, the climate warms and the soils warm, and they and then organic matter is being um, decayed in the soils. The respiration releases more CO two to the atmosphere which warms the climate even more. So we think that there's some positive uh, feedbacks going on there where other sources of carbon are being tapped in addition to the clathrates. What are you hoping to discover to kind of add to that knowledge by continuing to, to come out here? Well, <laughs> what drives my continued interest in this time interval is just trying to basically get a better handle on how rapidly things changed, how much they changed. So I'm very interested in how the climate changed. And one of the things that's, um, that's possible to do with plants is to basically reconstruct the climate using both um, where the living relatives of the fossils currently live and also the shapes and sizes of leaves. Both of those can be used in a somewhat independent way to, to reconstruct climate. So, we, uh, so I keep coming out hoping to find new fossils and um, that, they will, that those new fossils will illuminate uh, what kind of climate change has happened and then also um, by putting together a more detailed record, um, maybe getting a sense of the pace of change. So um, both both the pace of change and the, I don't know, I guess you could call it the texture of climate change. Uh, so we know warmer, we know that the plants seem to think it's drier, um, but what is that drier? Is, that, is it actually that there's less rainfall overall, or is it that, that the rainfall is distributed in um, narrower parts of the year? So maybe a big rainstorm and then no rain for a few weeks and it's very warm, so the plants are water stressed and then another rainstorm. And it's possible we might be able to actually get at some of that here in the Bighorn Basin because we can um, move around. I mean, it's not um, it's not a small area. We we can travel for maybe a hundred or one hundred and twenty kilometers and trace these these um, strata and know what where we are in time. And some parts of the basin we think were wetter than other parts. So, um, is the change in the forest? as big in the wetter areas as it was in the drier areas. And questions like that keep me coming back.
Uh, looking for more fossils. <laughs> <laughs> While I've been digging through quarries with you, I've seen some very impressive, beautiful fossil plants preserved on surfaces. Do you have a favourite that you always hope to see when you're breaking open rocks? There, are, I, I don't really have a favourite plant fossil, but but um, there is. I always like finding something new, and that's that's um, that happens mm-hmm. <laughs> because our our samples of the plants are so localized, uh, as I was describing earlier, because they're so. Um, there's such snapshots in time and space uh, of the of the whole vegetation. Um, we we always have the possibility of finding something that's different that we've never seen before, even if if we're working in exactly the same time, even if the the horizon we're working we've traced out from a few hundred meters away. We we walk along a hillside. If you dig a hole, you might find something different. And that is very exciting. So I, I guess the answer is that um, I don't have a favorite. The favorite is always the latest new thing that I didn't see before. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what it is as I'm, long as you haven't seen it. I'm, I'm very fickle that way. It's whatever is new. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you've been coming out here for a long time, which I presume means you have some good stories. So just to finish off, can we have... Perhaps your, uh, I don't know, can you pick your best dramatic fieldwork story? Sure. Um, <laughs> I think, I think my, my favorite story is, is the, um, was actually the, the discovery of the first really good plant fossils from the PETM. And it was, uh, let me see, it was 2005 and I had pretty much just arrived in the field and I um, had with me a, um, a college student, someone who just finished college, was, had never been in the field before, um, a man named Will. And, and Will and I were out collecting, and we, it was his first day in the field ever, and we, were, we had driven way up this... Uh, dry creek bed and we're exploring an area that I didn't know that much about and as sometimes happens when I'm doing field work I kind of lost track of time and we were walking over one hill and the next hill and the next hill and um, I forgot about lunch and it was a pretty hot day and I think he had run out of water. I think Will was out of water. And it was probably two or three or maybe even four in the afternoon. And finally we decided we'd better head back to the car to get some water. And And we came over this hill on the way back and I thought, oh, I'd better check that. So I, um, I said, just a second, Will, um, I need to, need to, dig into this hillside here and uh, and see if there are any plant fossils. And I dug in and within just one or two shovelfuls out popped a pretty nice plant fossil. And so I knelt down, started digging a little bit faster and more plant fossils came out. And I looked at them and I realized that I had never seen them before. There were two, three new species, four new species. And I, th- and I realized there's, there's only one explanation because I'd been collecting for a long time and I knew what the late Paleocene flora looked like and I knew what the early Eocene flora looked like and this was not either. And I knew that meant that I had finally found a really good site in the PETM. So I was that made me want to dig faster. And I just, I was so happy that I started to cry. <laughs> so there I am kneeling on the ground, digging like a rabbit into this hillside, plant fossils popping out beautiful leaves. And, and I'm crying and laughing. And then I remembered that I had Will with me 
And I looked up and he was standing just a few feet away looking at me. <laughs> and I thought, what is that expression on his face? He seemed, and then I realized that he was a little bit scared <laughs> because he didn't know where we were and he didn't know where the car was. And the guy who had brought him here was kneeling on the ground crying <laughs> tears of joy and I'm sure he must have been thinking I'm never getting out of here alive <laughs> there's no way so I said well I've been looking for this for since you were probably about 10 years old and I'm just a little bit happy right now <laughs> to have finally found these fossils and I he was he was a good sport about it, <laughs> so we we uh, wrapped up those and and headed back to the truck. But it was uh, it was kind of a good reminder that <laughs> my my obsessions are not necessarily understood by all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary, who was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.